Uh, we have a nice crowd today. I'm very pleased to have you all here. And we have a very interesting speaker too. So it should be a very nice afternoon. Introductions. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Cooney, which she needs an introduction. Our guest speaker today uh, is here at this table. Mr. Cooney, thank you for being with us today. In a few minutes, I'm gonna let you get back and finish your conversations and your meal. In a few minutes, we'll, we'll start cutting the cake. What we intend to do is to recognize our, our League of Women Voters for its 100th anniversary that just precede the, the um, 19th Amendment being passed um, in Congress. Um, as you're well aware, uh, that was a humongous uh, achievement. Uh, this country has been worried, uh, been fighting for women's rights since its inception. And finally, 100 years ago, uh, women got that right to vote. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we're still fighting for the right of many women to, for, to win the, uh, or to practice the, their vote. Uh, that's a very serious issue right now. And the, the final thing is the equality uh, of women in other areas of our society, in the law and um, various uh, rules and regulations that go on that still to this day um, hold women in a subordinate position. That fight is being fought as we speak in Washington today. So with that, let's get into the festive mood and, and think about what our sisters did for us 100 years ago. And uh, the first thing I'd like to do is invite all of the past presidents to go to the table back where the cake is so we can get a photograph. And then in about 15 minutes, we'll start our program. Thank you. I hope you're enjoying our birthday celebration. I'm Beverly Bean. And as chair of the Centennial Committee for the League, I just wanted to let you know that there will be more Centennial celebrations as the year goes on. Uh, we will be marching in the 4th of July parade. We hope we'll be in suffrage white. And I hope you will all come out and join us. Today, we have with us one of the leading historians on the subject of women's suffrage in this country. Robert P.J. Cooney, Jr. is the author of Winning the Vote, The Triumph of the American Women's Suffrage Movement. Uh, he has his book, and his latest book as well, for sale and signing in the lobby after the program today. And I just wanted to let you know that the League of Women Voters has purchased three copies of his book, and we will be donating them to the Monterey County Free Library System, the Salinas City Library System, and the Monterey Pacific Grove City Library System. So. <laughs> Mr. Cooney has celebrated the historic drive to win the vote for more than 25 years and is a recognized expert on this historic nonviolent movement. In 1993, he started the Women's Suffrage Media Project to popularize this little known history. And in 2005, he published Winning the Vote. Mr. Cooney received the National Women's History Alliance annual Write Women Back Into History Award in 2005. And in 2016, he edited Remembering Inez, the last campaign of Inez Milholland, a suffrage martyr. Mr. Cooney is a native of St. Louis, Missouri, and he lives in Half Moon Bay, California. Please join me in welcoming Robert P.J. Cooney. Thank you, Beverly, and Howard, and the entire league here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for this celebration of the centennial of women winning the right to vote and the League of Women Voters. This is a very exciting story to me, and it's held my attention for 25 years. I've been a, an activist and a graphic designer most of my life. So uh, my approach to the suffrage movement was re really say, what did it look like and how did it happen? You know, what can we do to really help people understand that they have power and you can organize your power to, to change society? So that's been my thrust to try to understand how it worked and then to try to share it with other people. So uh, as you all know, it's the year of the centennial of the League of Women Voters and of women winning the right to vote, which is an event that marks a critical turning point in American history. This year opened with a women's suffrage centennial float in the Pasadena Rose Parade on New Year's Day, which I hope some of you saw. It was a magnificent spectacle. It was a float that was 55 feet long, 
covered with roses, especially uh, yellow roses, and had the 25-foot tall Statue of Liberty covered in eucalyptus leaves. <laughs> and it was followed by 10 rows of 10 women each in white, marching down the entire parade route, waving and getting cheered by the people. And it was a really exciting, upbeat part of the Rose Parade to everybody who was part of it. The float won a theme award for capturing the parade's theme of hope. There are exciting plans underway for the rest of the year, too, including an effort by women skydivers to set a world record <laughs> of 100 women linking arms and falling to the earth at 180 miles an hour. And 100 would be a world record. So this is going to be in Chicago in July, which is just one of the things. And it's interesting to me that there's so many different parts of our society that are recognizing the centennial, you know, motorcycle riders, people flying out of airplanes, this sort of thing. <laughs> Um, there's going to be uh, buildings illuminated in suffrage colors in the upper right, um, official buildings like the government buildings, the governor's house and things like that, but also it's an option for people themselves and, and individual buildings to be lit up. This is for August 26 especially, but that whole period in there. And uh, <coughs> her flag is one that's illustrated here, and there's several art projects that are going on. That should symbolize that there are exhibits, there are lots of exhibits and lots of art projects that are happening. And a Nunet statue for New York Central Park. This is the first statue of real women in Central Park. It's all men or it's fantasy people like the Wizard of Oz or things like that. So there's been a, a huge effort for a long time to get a statue of women. And this is going to be Susan B. Anthony, um, Sojourner Truth, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. So this will be a lovely uh, statue in Central Park that will be dedicated on August 26th this year. So what is it we're celebrating, really? <clears throat> Throughout 2020, we celebrate the passage of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution that enfranchised half the population. We'll also celebrate the rise and empowerment of women throughout the country and the successful nonviolent civil rights movement that women waged and won despite overwhelming obstacles. The drive for votes for women or women's suffrage lasted over 72 years from before the Women's Rights Convention in 1848 to after 1920. Next. To the present, really, in terms of the ongoing struggle for voting rights. Native American women, Asian Americans, and black Americans, particularly in the South, did not immediately benefit from the 19th Amendment, whose implementation was blocked by other discriminatory laws and practices. But valiant women like these kept struggling to win their basic civil rights and eventually to triumph. The suffrage movement is literally a central part of our American history. It reflects both the limits and the hopes of our democracy and the fervent, undying drive for self-government. One thing that I learned in describing suffragists' goal as, as simply equality with men is a bit misleading. Professor Ellen Du Bois wrote that freedom might be a better slogan to emblazon on women's rights banners than equality. What women were seeking was emancipation from their subordination to men. It was always about autonomy, independence, and liberation, and not just the vote or legal position. That sense of freedom is almost tangible in this image of excited and determined suffragists joining hands, marching down the street in the 1915 suffrage parade in New York City. Women winning their basic civil rights is a story of working together and claiming power. Many of the tactics suffragists chose are still quite relevant to affect social change today. As suffragists showed, taking action is the most direct answer to injustice and social ills. They chose to speak out, to organize, and to willingly sacrifice for their cause. Year after year, women throughout the country took on leadership roles, risked their reputations, gave their time and savings, and dared controversial actions to move their cause ahead. So how did they do it? This is what I was fascinated by. How did women win their own civil rights, and how did they exactly change the US Constitution? This is no small feat. To briefly summarize today, I divided the movement into four parts or phases that reflect their priorities, although they all overlap to some degree. The first is waging state campaigns, the second is going national, and the third is pressuring the federal government, all for the 19th Amendment. So the first phase is waging state campaigns. The suffrage movement grew from women's efforts in the states in the mid-19th century and gained momentum for 70 years. Residents of every state were involved, 
and the movement's history is mainly in the states. Concerned women met together in the 1840s and 1850s and held women's rights conventions for more than a decade before they were interrupted by the Civil War. Early suffrage leaders spoke out, they organized, they wrote and published. Here are a few who became prominent from the early years. Lucy Stone started the American Women's Suffrage Association in 1870 and published the Women's Journal for decades. Stanton and Anthony began the National Women's Suffrage Association and for several years published the influential women's rights newspaper, The Revolution. In 1890, the two groups merged to become the National American Women's Suffrage Association, here called the National Association. After the Civil War, women's rights activists saw how easily former male slaves were enfranchised through a constitutional amendment. So that became their lasting goal. Here Elizabeth Cady Stanton testified for the amendment before the Congressional Committee in 1878, while Susan B. Anthony is on the left. Stanton later said she was so upset by the inattention of the men that she wanted to throw her manuscript at their head. <laughs> and that was the attitude, unfortunately, for years and years and years. So when the government and the courts showed no willingness to recognize women's rights, suffragists turned to the individual states. They believed that enough states would lead to a constitutional amendment. Susan B. Anthony, who turned 200 on, on Saturday, led these difficult state campaigns with local and visiting women throughout the 19th century into her 70s. Traveling extensively, she impressed audiences nationwide and became the public face for the suffrage movement. She also became a familiar figure in the Capitol, lobbying Congress herself every year for women's rights. Yet she was widely and viciously ridiculed satirized, criticized, and misrepresented, as these illustrations suggest. Here you have her as a goose on the bottom left with the other suffragists flocking to the Capitol. You have her dressed as Uncle Sam, and the upper right I love is she's chasing Grover Cleveland after he said some, <laughs> some very insulting things about women. Over time, however, reporters and the general public came to respect her for her in indomitable spirit, determination, good humor and common sense, she became a beloved figure. The drive for women's suffrage was a homegrown, grassroots movement with no public sanction, political support, or wealthy backing. The movement was made up of family and friends, women in particular of all ages and backgrounds, who devoted themselves to improving women's lives. Suffragists lobbied the legislatures in each state to have their measure placed on the ballot. And that was very difficult, and they lost more, most of those efforts. But when they succeeded, they ran ambitious campaigns to convince male voters. Suffragists tried this 18 times with virtually no funds before 1910. Men approved women's suffrage at only two elections in Colorado and Idaho. Wyoming and Utah were territories that became equal suffrage states in the 1890s. So these four, symbolized by four stars, were the only places women could vote equally with men when Susan B. Anthony died in 1906. She was nationally mourned, finally recognized as an exceptional individual and leader of American women. These state electoral campaigns were not for the faint-hearted. They were arduous and all-consuming adventures that demanded months of travel, a wider range of skills, and an unusual degree of self-sufficiency. Suffrage organizers like Boston's Margaret Foley here were exceptional women who were able to meet the early challenges. These women created a number of leagues, clubs, and organizations to advance their cause. They took a nonpartisan stance, and they regularly cooperated with men. Some of these women later became leaders in the League of Women Voters. The foremost example is Carrie Chapman Catt. Carrie Lane, as she was born, was a teacher and school superintendent in Iowa. She joined her state suffrage association around 1887 when she was 28 and later wrote, I have given my life to the suffrage work. I have opened the doors of churches and halls and lighted the kerosene lamps, attended to the babies while the meeting was in progress, made the speech, taken the collection, pronounced the benediction, organized the club or committee, and have held all the offices imaginable from club president up, down, and sidewise. So that's the early experience of the, of the league, which is still continues, I think. Cat campaigned in the western states during the 1890s, often in the company of Susan B. Anthony. and had her first taste of success as an organizer in Colorado in 1893. There, male voters approved equal suffrage at the polls for the very first time. 
This image from an 1896 contest in California shows Susan in the middle with Anna Howard Shaw on the left and Carrie Catt on the right. In 1900, Catt was elected to succeed Susan Anthony as head of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Catt led the struggling group for four years, putting it on a firmer foundation with more state participation. She was succeeded for 11 years by Anna Howard Shaw, who had also traveled and learned from Susan B. Anthony. In the following years, Carrie Catt traveled around the world, meeting with women on three continents. In 1912, she was a guest of the Chinese Women's Rights Convention. She later noted, you cannot imagine how hard is the struggle for liberty which they have to make. International travel seasoned the Midwesterner and added a larger context to her work. When she returned home to lead the effort in New York, she continued to be active as president of the International Women's Suffrage Association, which she founded. At about the same time Carrie Catt was coming to national prominence, Maud Wood Park was organizing college women. Park went to a women's suffrage meeting in 1900 and realized that she was the youngest person there. <laughs> So she and another Radcliffe senior organized the first college equal suffrage league in Boston. Over the following decades, she traveled widely to organize branches of the new league. This rare homemade poster for a meeting of the college league at Stanford around 1910. Park told students and recent graduates that they were indebted to early women's rights advocates because their work enabled women to go to college, like these marching graduates in caps and gowns in New York. Maud Park also traveled, as Kat did, to study women's conditions in other countries before returning to help lead the drive for suffrage in Massachusetts. A new generation of suffragists rose up throughout the country during these years. These women were all active in their own states and beyond. Alice Paul and Lucy Burns later founded the National Woman's Party, and at the bottom picture suggests the founding of the Woman's Suffrage Party in New York in 1909, with state leader Carrie Catt seated on the right. Suffrage speakers and field workers from the National Association crisscrossed the country for decades, despite the difficulties and personal dangers, to put their case directly to state voters. And that unwavering faith in democracy is part of what we remember and celebrate today. Looking closely at California offers a good example of what these state contests were like. Here's an open air votes for women rally in the 1911 outside UC Berkeley. Margaret Haley, a suffrage speaker and school teacher from Chicago, stands ready to speak. As in most states, the 1911 California campaign was led by local women and men, including older experienced suffragists, as well as new college graduates, working girls, professionals, business, and club women. It's good to remember that each state drive was run by real women and men who we can identify if we try. Elizabeth Watson led the California Equal Suffrage Association, the statewide group. Charlotte Whitney led the College Equal Suffrage League. John Brawley founded the Political Equality League in Southern California. And Maud Younger was a talented labor organizer in Northern California. Ellen Sargent was a widely respected pioneer. Lillian Coffin founded the Club Women's Franchise League. Mary Keith was a generous supporter from Berkeley, and Clara Foltz led the Votes for Women Club in Los Angeles. So you can get a sense of the variety of different organizations that it took to do it. The federal building in Los Angeles is now named for Clara Foltz. After dividing the state in two, suffragists from those many groups canvassed the great state, creating a highly visible campaign that gained national attention. The contest featured innovations like giant posters, great electrical signs, lantern slideshows, the use of automobiles for street speaking, and rallies and meetings of every kind. This campaign poster cleverly advised men to give your girl an equal chance with your boy. A nice way to put that, I think. Local women organized clubs throughout the state and created floats like this one from San Diego calling for this radical idea of equal pay for equal work. This is 1909. Suffragists campaigned heavily in the Bay Area, where saloon interests were strongest, as well as in the vast areas of Central and Southern California. Experienced organizers came from other states and went out to the far counties and small towns to speak with farmers, ranchers, miners, loggers, and voters wherever they were. Women from all backgrounds participated in the campaign, some, like Chinese women, knowing that even if the amendment won, they would still not be allowed to vote. 
As the October 10th election grew closer, opponents became more vocal. Suffragists knew the contest would be close, as most of the contests were. On election day, early Bay Area returns showed that the measure had been soundly defeated. However, over the next three days, the results from the different counties came in and narrowly swung the election in women's favor by a paper-thin average of only one vote per voting precinct, women in California won the right to vote. Here's a confident lady who's showing she can easily balance both family life and the ballot. That's the <laughs> old ballot box on the left. The election added a six star and electrified suffragists across the country. They're using the Statue of Liberty for the Western victories to try to alert and in, inform the people on the East Coast, who, for whom that's a very um, you know, local and clear symbol. And the stars were a, a factor that they kept using, one star, four stars, six stars, and, and on up as more states got um, equal suffrage. For the next three years, in the same manner, suffragists waged another 14 campaigns in three years and won five more states, further solidifying women's political power. But even in the states where suffragists never made the ballot, local and state associations still drew in and trained women who gained experience and rose to leadership locally and nationally. The National Association sent organizers, literature, and moral support to state contests, but the lack of strong national leadership with financial resources and clear direction resulted in more independent grassroots activity at the, at the state level. One example was the first organization of women voters. The National Council of Women Voters was founded by Western suffrage leader Emma Smith DeVoe in 1911 after Washington became the fifth equal suffrage state. This nonpartisan council of women voters educated new voters and backed equal suffrage in other states and public interest legislation. The Council of Women Voters grew to include all the equal suffrage states, mostly in the West, until it was eventually merged, you could see this coming, with the new League of Women Voters. So the second phase is going national. Gradually, suffragists won more states in the West, building up women's real political power. But in addition to organizing in each state, suffragists went national, refining their strategies, picking up partial victories, and targeting suffrage opponents. In one critical breakthrough, suffragists in Illinois, shown here finally crossing the Mississippi, <laughs> persuade, and happily, persuaded their state legislature in 1913 to pass a presidential suffrage bill. That allowed women to vote for some local offices and presidential electors every four years. So that didn't sound too bad to the legislators at the time, I think. It was a partial suffrage, and they could do that. They didn't have to go to a, a public election. So this allowed women to vote for some local offices and the presidential electors. Suffragists in other states soon did the same thing. They followed this strategy and built up, accepting partial victories, into a real political force. These are early hit pieces against anti-suffrage politicians. Even though women in the East couldn't vote, they still took on powerful opponents in the Massachusetts and New York legislatures and mounted effective campaigns against them. This bold new strategy also put other politicians on notice. Women didn't have to be voters to be politically involved. Another way suffragists became active nationally was putting pressure on the two major political parties, demanding their support for the suffrage amendment. In St. Louis for the 1916 Democratic Convention, suffragists staged a remarkable walkless parade to make clear their demands. Here, 8,000 suffragists in white and yellow formed a silent golden lane for nearly a mile on both sides of the street that Democratic delegates had to take to get to their convention. <laughs> That's the kind of cleverness, a walkless parade. What a great idea, huh? And 8,000. That's Woodrow Wilson crouching in the center under a cloud of gloom <laughs> as he passes down the golden lane. After ignoring women's demands for decades, both parties included suffrage in their 1916 platforms, but only on a state-by-state -state basis, not through a constitutional amendment. So you see these common partial moves that the politicians have to do. In reaction to the disinterest of the major parties, suffragists organized new political parties themselves. These included the Women's Suffrage Party in New York and the National Women's Party in Washington, D.C. 
At several national elections starting in 1914, Alice Paul called on women in the Western states who could vote to boycott Democratic candidates to force the ruling party to support the 19th Amendment. Oppose the party which blocks the national suffrage amendment. Defeat the Democratic candidates for Congress. Since 1914 and when it was 1916, they went against Woodrow Wilson. Another change with national impact came when male and female voters in Montana elected the very first woman to Congress. And she was organizer and state suffrage leader, Jeanette Rankin. Here she addressed supporters from Suffrage House in the Capitol with Carrie Catt in the background before taking her seat in 1917. Throughout this time, African-American women organized in their own communities with little connection to white suffragists or state organizations. Despite discrimination, particularly in the South, and racism everywhere, black women worked closely together in their own clubs, suffrage organizations, and church groups to educate others and advance the drive for women's rights. In 1896, the two largest African-American club associations merged to form the National Association of Colored Women. Delegates elected Mary Church Terrell, a leading suffragist, as their first president, and adopted the telling motto, lifting as we climb. W.B. Du Bois edited The Crisis, which was also pro-suffrage, and has just been digitized, by the way, so these new resources are coming to be more available. Suffragists were indeed going national. In one decade, from 1910 to 1920, they waged 36 state campaigns for a total of 54 altogether. Eventually, men in 15 states approved equal suffrage. Men had won real political power in nearly all the states in the West, as this wonderful image of the awakening from 1915 shows. Unenfranchised women elsewhere were reaching out for liberty. The next step was to make the federal government pass the 19th Amendment. The third phase is pressuring the federal government. In 1915, Carrie Catt, who is 56, was again elected to lead the National Association where her talent and experience were sorely needed. State campaigns had stalled and the federal government still dodged responsibility. Suffragists were divided, war was imminent, and the opposition seemed overwhelming. And this is where her leadership made a critical difference. After meeting with suffrage leaders across the country, Catt formulated a plan to finally push the federal amendment through. If her plan was rejected, she was prepared to resign. She called for harder work in each state for full or partial suffrage and finally put the full weight of the National Association behind the drive for the federal amendment. Carrie Catt's proposal became known as the winning plan and its genius was how it offered suffragists in each state a set of customized goals that coordinated with work on, throughout the country on a national level. She insisted on the agreement of 36 state suffrage leaders who pledged to keep the plan secret to catch opponents off guard. To lead this renewed lobbying effort in Washington, D.C., she turned to Maud Wood Park, who for the next two years led a quietly effective lobbying effort out of the drafty old Capitol mansion they rented and called Suffrage House. Women came from around the country to lobby their state representatives under Maud Park's watchful eye, while Jeanette Rankin championed the cause in Congress. This final version of suffragist congressional committee became known as the front door lobby, named for its straightforward approach. These women worked diligently through freezing weather, wartime shortages, and the deadly flu epidemic to keep their bill moving through Congress despite the overwhelming physical and emotional demands of World War I. In 1917, suffragists increased pressure on the federal government, specifically the president and congressman to support the 19th Amendment. While mainstream suffragists with the National Association continued to lobby and court politicians, the more militant National Women's Party took further steps to break the logjam. In early 1917, they began to silently picket the White House, demanding action. Banners asked, Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage? And Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? And the suffragists put these questions on their banners so that people walking by would say them and ask that question and had a beautiful way of, of tying the people who saw the demonstration into the purpose of the demonstration. Led by Alice Paul's Women's Party, suffragists kept up the picketing throughout the year despite freezing temperatures and the declaration of war. 
When the Wilson administration ordered Capitol Police to begin arresting the picketing suffragists in the spring, more women arrived to take their place. <laughs> Hundreds were arrested during 1917, and when they refused to pay their fines for obstructing traffic, they were sent to jail. The pickets outside the White House were often mobbed, jeered, and insulted by mobs of men like this before the police arrived and arrested the women. They were attacked repeatedly, but these silent suffragists stood firm against the abuse. As more pe women were sentenced to prison for blocking the sidewalk, they decided to claim status as political prisoners, jailed not for their crimes, but for their political beliefs. When the prison administrators ignored their demand, Many of these women responded by going on a hunger strike in prison. Prisoners, including Alice Paul, were brutally force-fed through tubes forced down their throats or noses. It was a form of torture that drew national outrage and put additional pressure on politicians to act. This Im image is from the suffrage movement in Britain where the same procedure happened. Suffragists across the country struggled desperately to keep their cause alive and keep pressure on Congress and the president during the war. Alice Paul, Carrie Catt, and other leaders pointed out the bitter irony of the nation fighting a war to defend democracy abroad while denying women democracy at home. Here's suffragist Lucy Branham burned the words of President Wilson in Lafayette Park, just across from the White House, to protest his hypocrisy. Simultaneous with this year of picketing, arrests, and torture, New York was the scene of the last great state campaign in 1917 and it carried national importance. The drive involved women already consumed by wartime demands and appealed to men's patriotic fervor. We're ready to work beside you, fight beside you, and die beside you. Let us vote beside you. Over the previous year, suffragists gathered the signatures of over one million New York women who said they wanted to vote and mounted these signatures on great boards that they carried in the climactic 1917 parade. This strategy disproved the anti-suffragist central claim that most women didn't want to vote. The hard-won victory in New York on November 6, 1917, was seen as the writing on the wall by the politically observant. With the richest and most influential state on board, politicians and party leaders came to grudgingly accept the inevitability of women voting. Politicians understood that even without the 19th Amendment, women would be able to vote for president in 30 states in 1920. Women had won equal suffrage in 15 states and partial suffrage in another 15 states where women could vote for presidential electors. Suffragist strategies had already positioned many women as powerful voting citizens. The final battle in Washington, D.C. included an intense lobbying drive by both the National Association and the Women's Party that grew to involve thousands of women from across the nation. Suffragists testified before congressional committees, kept card files on congressmen, organized local pressure, and overcame every obstacle to steer their controversial bill through Congress. And opponents delayed action for as long as they could. Finally, the strength of suffragists' demands and the force of their pressure won Congress over. In response to the intense lobbying, the picketing, and especially the real political gains in so many states, both houses of Congress narrowly approved the 19th Amendment in 1919. In June, it was sent to the states to ratify. Suffragists needed to win 36 out of 48 states, and opponents only needed 13 states to defeat the amendment. Here is where suffragist strength in the states really paid off, in getting governors like Kentucky's Edwin Morrow here to back immediate ratification. In many states, special sessions needed to be called, and some governors were resistant. But by July 1920, the suffrage amendment had won approval by 35 state legislatures, most at special sessions. And this was because of the intense work by suffragists during that 15-month that period. Carrie Catt led the difficult drive to win the final state, Tennessee, going there for a week and spending two tension-filled months. But with the last narrow victory on August 18th, the 19th Amendment was ratified and became part of the Constitution on August 26, 1920. After 72 years of effort, over 20 million women were enfranchised. This was the largest single extension of suffrage without a revolution, and it was accomplished solely through disciplined, nonviolent action. At the final celebration after the last suffrage parade, 
Carrie Catt told her colleagues, I have lived to realize the great dream of my life, the enfranchisement of women. We are no longer petitioners. We are not wards of the nation, but free and equal citizens. Let us practice the dignity of a sovereign people. Across the country, celebrations marked the final victory. Women had won their long struggle and were finally included in the Constitution. The women's justice bell and church bells rang, and women nationally began a new chapter as full American citizens. Not all women could vote, however, and decades would go by before unjust laws were changed. Since new obstacles continue to appear, safeguarding our hard-won rights is still important, still paramount. So afterwards, the question is, what happened after 1920? After Congress passed the amendment, Carrie Catt proposed reconstituting the National American Woman Suffrage Association into a new League of Women Voters, hoping to channel the energy of suffragists in the states after the final victory. Maud Wood Park returned to the Capitol as the first head of this new organization and led the League for the first four years. With former suffragists filling its ranks, the League immediately began to educate the millions of new women voters. In keeping with its heritage, the League was largely nonpartisan, welcomed civic-minded men, and actively represented the public interest. The activist nature of the suffrage movement continued to influence the League's work, encouraging public displays and popular presentations, as well as careful research and analytical work. Belle Sherwin, a former suffrage leader from Ohio, was the League's second president. She served for 10 years and helped establish the League's reputation as a serious, accountable, and objective organization. Sherwin described the early League, and this is in the 1930s, as a university without walls, where members enter to learn and remain to shape the curriculum. Former Minnesota suffrage leader Marguerite Wells was the League's third president, serving the next 10 years until 1944. As president, she donated a portrait of Carrie Chapman Cap to the Smithsonian's <laughs> National Portrait Gallery, where it hangs today. Wells' vision of the League called for a nucleus of people in each community who would carry a continuing responsibility for government. She envisioned that these individuals, today's League's members, actually, would offer informed leadership on issues as they arose. There's a great story, before I finish, of Marguerite Wells that speaks to the personal passion behind all this. Like all these other notable women, she wasn't always a little old lady. As a young girl on the unsettled prairie, she took a precocious interest in government. She once persuaded her father, who was a member of the territorial legislature, to let her accompany him to an all-male party caucus. Marguerite dressed as a boy and went disguised in a slicker with a cap pulled down over her short bobbed hair. And she was exhilarated by the talk she heard. These were men planning their common future and building their own government. You can imagine her genuine youthful excitement at being where she felt she belonged. She returned home and wrote an account of it in rhyme. She later became a leader of women in Minnesota and then the nation. Marguerite Wells' vision of people taking a continuing responsibility for government is exactly what our suffrage foremothers did and encouraged others to do. In fact, for many years, the League was the main way women could become aware and active politically beyond voting. It took decades before the major political parties opened up to women and seriously supported women candidates. And when they did, many of those women had come up through the League. A hundred years ago, suffragists passed the torch to new generations of women who have become a vital force in American politics. A hundred years later, their dream is still alive and continues to inform and inspire us. In fact, it's a precious source of strength and hope. From its beginning, the League of Women Voters not only channeled the heritage of the suffrage movement, it also trained women to become informed civic leaders at the local, state, and national levels. Following in the footsteps of suffragists, League members held elected representatives accountable for, their, for true democracy and laid the foundation for equal political participation. Because the League successfully encouraged people to take responsibility for self-government, it has literally been making democracy work. Suffragists left us with a noble inheritance. It's one that embodies courage, commitment, and sacrifice, and also women's vision for our nation. 
We owe suffragists a great debt for their love and perseverance in moving the United States into becoming a more complete democracy. Harriet Stanton Blatch, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter, was justifiably proud when she wrote that American women were the first disfranchised class in history who, unaided by any political party, won enfranchisement by its own effort alone and achieved the victory without the shedding of a drop of human blood. On this historic centennial, we celebrate the 19th Amendment, the empowerment of women, and their inspiring nonviolent victory. Ratification of women's rights and women's dreams was finally realized by the efforts of women and the votes of men 100 years ago. It's a lasting heritage we share and can all be proud of. It's an honor to pay tribute to American suffragists and to the League of Women Voters on their 100th anniversary. Here's to the continued success of our League and to further flowering of our precious democracy. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you to honor these women and what they accomplished. This is my book from which most of these images were taken. Thank you very much. Can we go one more? Can we go one more? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will mention while I'm here, before we do something else, is a gazette that I edited for the National Women's History Alliance. And I didn't, we didn't have enough, so I just brought one for each table for now. But it's online. It can be downloaded. It can be viewed online. And uh, it's, you can get it in paper, too, if you write to the National Women's History Alliance. Uh, and so it's a... Uh, the purpose is to encourage groups around the country and people around the country to celebrate the centennial. So we went to every, all the states and tried to record what each state is doing and what organizations there are. There's some fabulous websites now in um, Texas or Tennessee or any number of states that, are, that have a deep research into the suffrage movement within that state. So if there's a state, California being one, you're interested in finding out more about, there's an intensive drive to find out more about suffrage history throughout the country. So it's very encouraging that way. Thank you very much, Robert. That was wonderful. Um, Robert's uh, agreed to stick, along, stick around and answer questions. If you have to leave, be, be, uh, be, feel free to go. Uh, but we'll continue uh, for a while and see how many questions we can answer. Thank you for your presentation and for your uh, passion on behalf of this. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. I noticed a lot of um, anti-suffrage buttons and things like that. And you didn't touch on who, who were the opposers. So could you talk about that, please? Somebody asked me if, they could, if I could list the anti-suffragists. So I said, well, you start at the president, and then you include the Supreme Court and all of Congress for 100 years at least. So it was that kind of thing. There was male opposition. Um, the funding, a lot of it came from the liquor industry. And the liquor industry was huge, and it included the, the people who grow the field, you know, the, the crops, and then the transportation, and the banking, and so it was very integrated, especially in the Midwest. So there was a fear of prohibition coming with women's votes. So they raised a lot of money, and a lot of the organized opposition, the anti-suffragists, were funded by the liquor industry. Ironically, women didn't have the vote when prohibition was passed. That was in 1917, so they were off base, clearly. Where was that uh, stone carving of the three women? Yeah, that's the suffrage monument, and it's in the Capitol, U.S. Capitol. Um, it's in Statuary Hall now. It was donated to the government by Alice Paul's National Women's Party to celebrate the, the, the uh, passage of the 19th Amendment. The government didn't do anything. So the, the suffragists took the initiative, like the portrait of Carrie Catt. It took the initiative to, to say, Here's a, it's important to our country. So they donated the monument to the government, and they put it in the basement of the Capitol. And on the, night, on the uh, 75th anniversary, we started to have a campaign to bring that up. And I think uh, several years later, it was brought up to the Statuary Hall, where it is now. It's very heavy, and it's a beautiful, solid uh, commemoration. Thank you so much. This was uh, outstanding from my perspective. Um, and I couldn't help but draw parallels to then and the political situations we're in now. Uh, do you plan on writing about that, using your wealth of historical knowledge and model, the model you presented here, and, and bringing it into this uh, current time? I'd love to read it. Thank you. I think a lot of it is saying, here's what they did, 
And by that, here's boycotts, you know, here's uh, picketing, here's active things that people can do as well as lobbying. Hopefully we'll inspire people, you know, and direct them in that direction. I did write a book about nonviolence. It's called The Power of the People, Active Nonviolence in the United States. And that was a long time ago. Um, and I gave the suffrage movement six pages because I couldn't find much about it. This was 1976. Um, so there's been a lot more research and ability to find things. But the United States has a long nonviolent tradition going back to those, you know, uh, William Penn and Henry David Thoreau and, you know, the labor movements, the peace movements, all those things. So there is a thrust of that already. As a longtime member of the League of Women Voters since about 1955, uh, I was able to go to, as a delegate, to various national conventions. And in the 80s and 90s particularly, I remember some of the conven national conventions where we were debating over and over again, what shall we do about our name? Can we keep it be the League of Women Voters? And all sorts of different things were suggested, but every time it was turned down, even by male members who said no, Keep the name because your name recognition is so great that it would be disastrous to say, well, formerly known as the League of Women Voters, you know. <laughs> and so we kept the name League of Women Voters, even though, of course, we have many male members. And it's a lasting name. Here it is 100 years later, I, and that discussion didn't go very far, did it? I think that's very wise. And it ties the Gleek into the suffrage movement. You know, when there were, when women voters was a new idea. People don't think about this so much anymore, I think. I've never heard a scholar refer to Cherry Cat, Carrie Chapman Cat and Alice Paul in the same sentence before. Uh, only they were always described as opposing poles. And I just uh, wondered if you could say a little bit more about why you saw them apparently, as working together just in a different, a little bit different way, not, not opposing each other. It's a, it's a longer term view, but uh, the only time I think I linked them was when they were both talking about the irony of fighting a war abroad, you know, when you didn't have democracy at home. But you're right, they were rivals within this. Carrie Chapman Catt was the leader of the national organization. And then you've got these young people coming up over here after all these years. They got all this energy. They want to go out and do stuff and, and do things that, from our perspective, Carrie Katz's perspective, would be bad for us. You know, you don't want to alienate the president, for instance. You don't want to uh, boycott the party, you know. But Alice Paul said, this is what we have to do, you know. And she was smart. People would say you'd lose all your support, but no, she didn't lose her support. Wilson signed it, you know. It was a matter of political pressure and having a sense of what's appropriate and what's going to work. And I think, that, I think both of these women had that sense. Carrie Catt obviously was a good organizer and administrator, but Alice Paul had a sense. She had a political sense about who to talk to, um, how to make things work, just an incredible uh, charisma, I think. And, like, and yeah, and, 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 and engaging people, having people want to help, having people want to come in and, and do that. So it was a remarkable ability. There's excellent uh, biographies of both these women out now, if you want to... Um, explore them. Biography is a great way to get into this movement. Rather than looking at history, look at the people and then you learn about all the history through there. Uh, speaking of Alice Paul, she is the subject of our National Equality Day performance and she was quite a radical. Uh, I forgot to mention, this is not a question, I'm sorry sir, uh, that in August at the same month as we're having this performance we're hoping to have a series of suffrage films and show them at the Monterey Public Library community room. So if you have any suggestions of films you know of, uh, I'd be happy to hear them. And I also wanted to mention that our uh, past president, Dennis Marr, has prepared a uh, program of local suffrage history, which he also will be presenting in August at the Monterey Public Library. And I thank you so much for this excellent presentation. Dennis's sounds very good, too. I'd be interested in that. You mentioned something about the um, the discord between some of the African American women suffragists and the mainstream white, more middle class. I know that some of those women that we honor, when you look back in their history, they were quite racist. Do you have any comments on that or any resources that, that we could 
look into that more and see if that's been carried forward? It's a, it's a very uh, topical issue right now, looking at the racism within the suffrage movement. Um, it struck me unusually because I, I knew there were black suffragists, so we can't whitewash the suffrage movement by saying they were all racist. It was uh, integrated throughout the country with different um, allies, you know, Sojourner Truth allied with Anthony and um, Perkins went with uh, others, you know, Francis Perkins went with the uh, Lucy Stone. So you had these divisions and alliances of different sorts. But uh, there was clearly racism and, and um, prejudice and discrimination within the suffrage movement and within the early leagues too. And so there's, a, there's different histories that look into how that happened. The league split in some states, you know, and um, the issue of black women having a voice was very hard, you know, that wasn't allowed for very long. But certain leagues started to break up and, and allow that. So it became more encompassing. Um, I think we try to figure out how do we learn from past experiences and how do you learn from, your Susan B. Anthony is an exceptional person and she said some horrible things on occasion, you know, but she was a very, very decent folk person. Um, so to say where was good and where was bad is starting to help us understand what's right and wrong, you know, and how we look at history and how we evaluate it. So I think the important thing for us was to not deny it, but to say it, it really was an issue. And then what do we do with that? How do we learn more about it and how do we, um, try to resolve our sense of, of that reality in our lives still today, too. And I'm delighted that it was out because racism is, permeates our society and we can really see it in the suffrage movement. But I was also resentful that people would come up, the New York Times um, had a columnist who said, you know, the, the white suffragists threw the black suffragists under the bus, basically, you know, and just was a blanket statement that um, just erased them from reality, from undercut their whole, um, you know, their, their legitimacy. And my sense is if you're gonna start talking about racism, let's talk about the government, let's talk about the military, let's talk about any, I mean, suffrage is fair enough too, but you're talking about the women who didn't have any rights here. You know, let's talk about the people who set the law. Women didn't have any, uh, you know, legal status to, to maintain racism, although certainly, you know, women agree, some women agree with that. So it was a question of sort of where's the emphasis? And if we're gonna do it to the suffragists, let's look at our nation and see where we stand on that and, and how we can improve, basically. Many countries in the world benefited from our effort here, and they have progressed to have many representations by women. We have women president in many countries. And in reflection, the United States is actually lacking behind. Do you know, uh, in your analysis, what is the reason that we are not progressing? I don't know the other countries as well, you know. They're, as well as some yeah. of the other countries. It's a, this is a huge country when you compare it to other countries. I think that's a big issue. And uh, there's that whole thousands of years history that these other countries have. So there's a, there's a complexity there that I can't appreciate. But I do know that the politics was based on experience. The boys were, um, were groomed by their their fathers to take over, and that happened in, in the Senate over and over again in Congress. Um, so there was a sense of uh, continu uh, continuing their own um, existence. So there wasn't room for women in that. And where are you going to get experience if you're not allowed to have an education? So that was a big issue for women. Um, once you get an education, well, have you got any companies? Well, no, there's no opportunities in business. So, you know, you see the... Uh, the politicians, well, here's the governor, you know, here's the business owner, here's the former congressman. So we didn't have that. Women didn't have that at the time, I don't think. You know, they didn't have the ability to come through, didn't have the preparation. Men get to be president without ever having experience. <laughs> it's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> and they point to women as some of the ones who voted for him. So it's a strange situation. It just says why this is so important, what we're doing here. One thinks about Western men as being the, the rugged part of our population, but the early voting for women uh, gravitated out of uh, the West. Why is that? I think from what I saw, part of the reason is that there was a sense of mutual risk and work, that the women worked next to the men, like in the fields or on the ranches and things like that. So there was a more connection that way. And 
This is the pioneer world out here. This is where the people who came, who didn't want to be part of the East Coast or the traditional hidebound kind of culture. So coming out to the Western states and settling in the ter territories, I think you had a selective group, and I think it reinforced itself once it was here when women came out too and were working and visible in a way that they weren't on the East Coast. I think it encouraged them. And again, the population was a lot, lot smaller. I understand that in Britain, when the women suffragists were beginning their work in the late um, 1800s, that it was extremely popular among educated women, which were not a large class of people, but wealthy women. Wealthy women who had property. And when suffrage came, it was for people who had property. So that eliminated a lot of people without saying people of color, people with no education, factory workers. And that was the case in the United States too, I believe in the when earlier began, years. The, uh, the British suffragettes were the militant ones and there were suffragists who weren't militant. So that, that's sort of where that whole phraseology came from. But when World War I started, they shut down. They immediately said, we're not gonna keep going. We're gonna support the government. And they felt they would be rewarded and, and were afterwards. And that was some of the theory in the United States, but Alice Ball said, no, we're not gonna stop. And Carrie Cat too, but they weren't gonna lobby and pressure the government as much. They were gonna go out to the states and try to organize as much as they could. Just another, another uh, perspective on the Western states. I read somewhere that the, uh, of course they were settled by men who were leaving the West Coast looking for jobs, looking for opportunity, but they were the risk takers, the miners, the timber people, the farmers or whatever, and the settlers and so on. But they needed women to help make families. So one of the reasons why Wyoming was one of the first ones is because they were trying to attract more women to come to the state. And this was a real, this is a real movement toward suffrage in, in order to attract women to the men side of the equation. And it worked. <laughs> Uh, there's a new book for uh, children, Alice Paul and the President. I don't know if you've seen it, but it had another thing I did, haven't heard too much of. It, it seems to imply that uh, Wilson's daughter made a connection with Alice Paul and, um, and that that had a role in the passage of the, his change of mind about it. I think it's certainly possible. I've heard that too. His, both his wives were not supportive of equal suffrage from what I gather, but family pressure is really important. We could see that with the, the man in the office today. You know, His daughter is an important force, I think, to some degree. But you never know that. You know, It's outside the realm of politics. It's sort of what happens behind the scenes. What about birth control? Because somewhere in there, does anyone know the date? Of, Margaret uh, Sanger was right in there. Yeah, yeah, but do you, I mean, you know, women voting and women getting uh, uh, independent and having birth control. I think there was, was much huge. more of a openness to that idea and um, she knew there was a need yeah. and it was the same period. She had suffragists who worked with her and she was arrested of course and put away and you know harassed quite a bit. So I think that she was again sort of like California being at the, the tip of the iceberg to, to break through and to say this is an important thing that's, that's gonna happen really. And poor Marge Sanger has been sort of character assassinated, and I think she's another woman who deserves a lot more attention and respect and appreciation. In my experience, in my study, I have found that the League of Women Voters has been involved in making changes in society, and uh, certainly it, it is a centennial, or if not quite, of that as well, of the League of Women Voters role. Uh, they were uh, involved in women's prisons, uh, in California especially, they uh, made Tehachapi, I would say, sort of, that sums it up. But I was thinking about redistricting and all of that that's happening in the way that's robbing especially people of color and their votes. And it, isn't that a role for the League of Women Voters to play in uh, looking at and challenging what's happening with redistricting? Uh, I hope you came to the uh, program planning committee meeting because that's where we put together our program for the coming year. And of course, as we've learned, uh, these issues hang around for 100 years. So if we didn't get it this year, we're going to work on it next year. Robert Cooney, thank you very much. It's been very thank you. enjoyable. Thank you.